Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of Dragons of Autumn Twilight by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you will be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support Bearded Book Club, you could do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. Number one, you could become a member of the YouTube channel and or become a Patreon and support us on a regular basis. Or number two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So without further ado, let us continue. Chapter 14 Prisoners of the Draconians Lying on the ground, panting for breath, Tasselhoff watched as the Draconians prepared to carry off his unconscious friends. The kender was well hidden beneath a bush near the swamp. The dwarf was stretched out next to him, knocked out cold. Taz glanced at him in remorse. He'd had no choice. In his panic, Flint had dragged the kender down to the cold water. If he hadn't clunked the dwarf over the head with his hoopox staff, neither of them would have surfaced alive. He hauled the comatose dwarf up out of the water and hidden him beneath a bush. Then Tasselhoff watched helplessly as the Draconians bounded his friends magically in what looked like strong spider webs. Tass saw that they were all apparently unconscious, or dead, because they didn't struggle or put up a fight. The Kender did get a certain amount of grim amusement out of watching the Draconians try to pick up Goldmoon's staff. Evidently they recognized it, for they croaked over it in their guttural language and made gestures of glee. One, presumably the leader, reached out to grasp it. There was a flash of blue light. Giving a screeching cry, the draconian dropped the staff and hopped up and down on the bank, uttering words Taz assumed were impolite. The leader finally came up with an ingenious idea. Pulling a fur blanket from Goldmoon's pack, the draconians laid it down on the ground. The creature picked up a stick and used it to roll the staff onto the blanket. Then it gingerly wrapped the staff in the fur and lifted it up triumphantly. The Draconians lifted the webbed bodies of the Kender's friends and bore them away. Other Draconians followed behind, carrying the companion's packs and their weapons. As the Draconians marched along a path very near the hidden Kender, Flint suddenly groaned and stirred. Taz clamped his hand over the dwarf's mouth. The Draconians didn't seem to hear and kept moving. Taz could see his friends clearly in the fading afternoon light as the Draconians passed. They seemed to be sound asleep. Caraman was even snoring. The Kender remembered Raceland's sleep spell and figured that was what the Draconians had used on his friends. Flint groaned again. One of the Draconians near the end of the line stopped and peered into the brush. Taz picked up his hoopock and held it over the dwarf's head just in case. But it wasn't needed. The Draconian shrugged and muttered to itself, then hurried to catch up with its squad. Sighing in relief, Taz looked. Taz took his hand off the dwarf's mouth. Flint blinked and opened his eyes. What happened? The dwarf moaned, his hand on his head. You fell off the bridge and hit your head on a log, Taz said glibly. I did, Flint looked suspicious. I don't remember that. I remember one of those draconian things coming at me and I remember falling into the water. Well, you did, so don't argue, Taz said hurriedly, getting to his feet. Can you walk? Of course I can walk, the dwarf snapped. He stood up a little wobbly but erect. Where is everybody? The draconians captured them and carried them off. All of them, Flint's mouth fell open, just like that. These draconians were magic users, Taz said impatiently, anxious to get started. They cast spells, I guess. They didn't hurt them except for Raceland. I think they did something terrible to him. I saw him as they passed. He looked awful. But he's the only one. The kinder tugged on the dwarf's wet sleeve. Let's go, we've got to follow them. Yeah, sure, Flint mumbled, looking around. Then he put his head hand on his head again. Where's my helm? At the bottom of the swamp, Tass said in exasperation. Do you want to go in after it? The dwarf gave the murky water a horrified glance, shivered, and turned away hurriedly. He put his hand to his head again and felt a large bump. I sure don't remember hitting my head, he muttered. Then a sudden thought struck him. He felt around his back wildly. My axe, he cried. Hush, Taz scolded. At least you're alive. Now we've got to rescue the others. And how do you propose to do that without any weapons except that overgrown slingshot? Flint grumbled. 
stumping along after the fast-moving Kender. We'll think of something, Taz said confidently, though he felt as if his heart were getting tangled up in his feet it had sunk so low. The Kender picked up the Draconian's trail without any trouble. It was obviously an old and well-used trail. It looked as though hundreds of Draconian's feet had tramped along it. Tasselhoff, examining the tracks, suddenly realized that they might be walking into a large camp of the monsters. He shrugged, no use worrying about such minor details. Unfortunately, Flint didn't share the same philosophy. There's a whole damn army up there, the dwarf gasped, grabbing the kinder by the shoulder. Yes, well, Taz paused to consider the situation. He brightened. That's all the better. The more of them there are, the less chance they'll have of seeing us. He started off again. Flint frowned. There was something wrong with that logic, but right now he couldn't figure out what, and he was too wet and chilled to argue. Besides, he was thinking the same thing the kinder was. The only other choice they had was to escape into the swamp themselves and leave their friends in the hands of the Draconians, and that was no choice at all. They walked another half hour. The sun sank into the mist, giving it a blood-red tinge, and night fell swiftly in the murky swamp. Soon they saw a blazing light ahead of them. They left the trail and sneaked into the brush. The kinder moved silently as a mouse. The dwarf stepped on sticks that snapped beneath his feet, ran into trees, and blundered through the brush. Fortunately, the draconian camp was celebrating and probably wouldn't have heard any an army of dwarves approaching. Flint and Taz knelt just be beyond the firelight and watched. The dwarf suddenly grabbed the kinder with such violence that he nearly pulled him over. Great reorks, Flint swore, pointing. A dragon! Taz was too stunned to say anything. He and the dwarf watched in amazed horror as the draconians danced and prostrated themselves before a giant black dragon. The creature lurked inside the remaining half-shell of a crumbled dome ruin. Its head was higher than the treetops. Its wingspan was enormous. One of the draconians, wearing robes, bent before the dragon, gesturing to the staff as it lay on the ground with the captured weapons. There's something strange about that dragon, Taz whispered after watching for a few moments. Like they're not supposed to exist? That's just the point, Taz said. Look at it. The creature isn't moving or reacting to anything. It's just sitting there. I always thought that dragons would be more lively, don't you know? Go up and tickle its foot, Flint snorted. Then you'll see lively. I think I'll do that, the kinder said. Before the dwarf could say a word, Tasselhoff crept out of the brush, flitting from shadow to shadow as he drew near the camp. Flint could have torn his beard out in frustration, but it wouldn't have been disastrous to try and stop him now. The dwarf could do nothing but follow. Tannis! The half-elf heard someone calling him from across a huge chasm. He tried to answer, but his mouth was stuffed with something sticky. He shook his head, then he felt an arm around his shoulders, helping him sit up. He opened his eyes. It was night. Judging by the flickering light, a huge fire blazed brightly somewhere. Sturm's face, looking concerned, was near his. Tannis sighed and reached out his hand to clasp the knight's shoulder. He tried to speak and was forced to pull off bits of the sticky substance that clung to his face and mouth like cobwebs. I'm all right, Tannis said when he could talk. Where are we? He glanced around. Is everyone here? Anyone hurt? We're in a draconian camp, Sturm said, helping the half-elf stand. Tasselhoff and Flynn are missing and Raceland's hurt. Badly? Tannis asked, alarmed by the serious expression on Sturm's face. Not good, the knight replied. Poison dart, Riverwind said. Tannis turned toward the plainsmen and got his first clear look at their prison. They were inside a cage made of bamboo. Draconian guards stood outside, their long, curved swords drawn and ready. Beyond the cage, hundreds of Draconians milled around a campfire. And above the campfire... Yes, Sturm said, seeing Tennis' startled expression. A dragon. More children's stories. Raceland would gloat. Raceland, Tennis went over to the mage who was lying in a corner of the cage, covered in his cloak. The young mage was feverish and shaking with chills. Goldmoon knelt beside him, her hand on his forehead, stroking back the white hair. He was unconscious. His head tossed fitfully, and he murmured strange words, sometimes shouting out garbled commands. 
Caraman, his face nearly as pale as his brother's, sat beside him. Goldmoon met Tannis's questioning gaze and shook her head sadly, her eyes large and gleaming in the reflected firelight. Riverwind came over to stand beside Tannis. She found this in his neck, he said, carefully holding up a feathered dart between thumb and forefinger. He glanced at the mage without love but with a certain amount of pity. Who can say what poison burns in his blood? If we had the staff, Goldmoon said. Right, Tennis said. Where is it? There, Sturm said, his mouth twisting wryly. He pointed. Tennis peered past hundreds of draconians and saw the staff lying on Goldmoon's fur blanket in front of the black dragon. Reaching out, Tennis grasped a bar of the cage. We could break out, he told Sturm. Caraman could snap this like a twig. Tasselhoff could snap it like a twig if he were here. Sturm said, of course then we'd only got a few hundred of these creatures to take care of, not to mention the dragon. All right, don't rub it in, Tannis sighed. Any idea what happened to Flint and Taz? Riverwind said he heard a splash just after Taz yelled out that we were being ambushed. If they were lucky, they dived off the log and escaped into the swamp. If not, Sturm didn't finish. Tennis closed his eyes to shut out the firelight. He felt tired, tired of fighting, tired of killing, tired of slogging through the muck. He thought longingly of lying down and sinking back into sleep. Instead, he opened his eyes, stalked over to the cage, and rattled the bars. A draconian guard turned around, sword raised. You speak common, Tannis asked in the very lowest, crudest form of the common language used on Kryn. I speak common, apparently better than you do, elven scum, the draconian sneered. What do you want? One of our party is injured. We ask that you treat him. Give him an antidote to this poison dart. Poison? The draconian peered into the cage. Ah, uh, yes, the magic user. The creature gurgled deep in its throat. A sound oblivious, obviously meant to be laughter. Sick, is he? Yes, the poison acts swiftly. Can't have a magic user around. Even behind bars, they're deadly. But don't worry, he won't be lonely. The rest of you will be joining him soon enough. In fact, you should envy him. Your deaths will not be nearly so quick. The draconian turned his back and said something to its partner, jerking its clawed thumb in the direction of the cage. Both of them croaked their gurgling laughter. Tannis, feeling disgust and rage welling up deep inside of him, looked back at Raislin. The mage was rapidly growing worse. Goldmoon put her hand on Raislin's neck, feeling for the life beat, and then shook her head. Caraman made a moaning sound, then his glance shifted to the two draconians, laughing and talking together outside. Stop, Caraman, Tannis yelled, but it was too late. With a roar like a wounded animal, the huge warrior leapt toward the draconians. Bamboo gave way before him, the shards splintered, splintering and cutting into his skin. Mad with the desire to kill, Caraman never noticed. Tennis jumped on his back as the warrior crashed past him, but Caraman shook him off as easily as a bear shakes off an annoying fly. Caraman, you fool, Sturm grunted as he and Riverwind both threw themselves on the warrior, but Caraman's rage carried him on. Whirling, one draconian raised his sword, but Caraman sent the weapon flying. The creature hit the ground, knocked senseless by a blow with the big man's fist. Within seconds, there were six draconians, bows and arrows in their hands, surrounding the warrior. Sturm and Riverwind wrestled Caraman to the ground. Sturm, sitting on him, shoved his face into the mud until he felt Caraman relax beneath him and heard him give a strangled sob. At that instant, a high-pitched, shrill voice screeched through the camp. "'Bring the warrior to me,' said the dragon. Tennis felt the hair rise on his neck. The draconians lowered their weapons and turned to face the dragon, staring in astonishment and muttering among themselves. Riverwind and Sturm got to their feet. Caraman lay on the ground, choking with sobs. The draconian guards glanced at each other uneasily, while those standing near the dragon backed off hurriedly and formed an immense semicircle around it. One of the creatures, whom Tannis supposed by the insignia on its armor to be some sort of captain, stalked up to a robed draconian who was staring, mouth open, at the black dragon. "'What's going on?' the captain demanded. The draconian spoke in the common tongue. Tannis, listening closely, realized that they were of different species. 
The robed draconians were apparently the magic users and the priest. Presumably, the two could not communicate in their own languages. The military draconian was clearly upset. Where is that Bazak priest of yours? He must tell us what to do. The higher of my order is not here, the robed draconian quickly regained his composure. One of them flew here and took him to confer with Lord Verminard about the staff. But the dragon never speaks when the priest is not here, the captain lowered his voice. My boys don't like it. You'd better do something quickly. What is this delay? The dragon's voice shrieked like a wailing wind. Bring me the warrior. Do as the dragon says, the robed draconian motioned quickly with a clawed hand. Several draconians rushed over, shoved Tennis and Riverwind and Stern back into the shattered cage, and lifted the bleeding caraman up by the arms. They dragged him over to stand before the dragon, his back to the blazing fire. Near him lay the blue crystal staff, Raceland's staff, their weapons, and their packs. Caraman raised his head to confront the monster, his eyes blurred with tears and blood from the many cuts the bamboo had inflicted on his face. The dragon loomed above him, seen dimly through the smoke rising from the bonfire. We met out just as swiftly and surely, human scum, the dragon hissed. As it spoke, it beat its huge wings, fanning them slowly. The draconians gasped and began to back up, some stumbling over themselves as they hurried to get out of the monster's way. Obviously, they knew what was coming. Caraman stared at the creature without fear. My brother is dying, he shouted. Do what you will to me. I ask only one thing. Give me my sword so that I can die fighting. The dragon laughed shrilly. The draconians joined it, gurgling and croaking horribly. As the dragon's wings beat the air, it began to rock back and forth, seemingly preparing to leap on the warrior and devour him. This will be fun. Let him have his weapon, the dragon commanded. Its flapping wings caused a wind to whip through the camp, scattering sparks from the fire. Caraman shoved the draconian guard aside. Wiping his hands across his eyes, he walked over to the pile of weapons and pulled out his sword. Then he turned to face the dragon, resignation and grief etched into his face. He raised his sword. We can't let him die out there by himself, Sturm said harshly, and he took a step forward, preparing to break out. Suddenly a voice came from the shadows behind them. St Tannis! The half-elf whirled around. Flint! he exclaimed, then glanced apprehensively at the draconian guards, but they were absorbed in watching the spectacle of Caraman and the dragon. Tannis hurried to the back of the bamboo cage where the dwarf stood. Get out of here, the half-elf ordered. There's nothing you could do. Raceland's dying and the dragon is Tasselhoff, Flint said succinctly. What? Tannis glared at the dwarf. Makes sense. The dragon is Tasselhoff, Flint repeated patiently. For once, Tannis was speechless. He stared at the dwarf. The dragon's made of wicker, the dwarf whispered hurriedly. Tasselhoff sneaked behind it and looked inside. It's rigged. Anyone sitting inside the dragon can make the wings flap and speak through a hollow tube. I guess that's how the priests keep order around here. Anyway, Tasselhoff's the one flapping his wings and threatening to eat Caraman. Tannis gasped. But what do we do? There's still a hundred draconians around. Sooner or later, they're going to realize what's going on. Get over to Caraman, you and Riverwind and Sturm. Grab your weapons and packs and the staff. I'll help Goldmoon carry Raceland into the woods. Tasselhoff's got something in mind. Just be ready. Tannis groaned. I don't like it any better than you do, the dwarf growled, trusting our lives to that rattle-brained kinder. But, well, he is the dragon, after all. He certainly is, Tannis said, eyeing the dragon, who was shrieking and wailing and flapping its wings and rocking back and forth. The draconians were staring at it in open-mouthed wonder. Tennis grabbed Sturm and Riverwind and huddled down near Goldmoon, who had not left Raceland's side. The half-elf explained what was happening. Sturm looked at him as if he were as crazed as Raceland. Riverwind shook his head. Well, have you got a better plan? Tennis asked. Both of them looked at the dragon, then back at Tannis and shrugged. Goldmoon goes with the dwarf, Riverwind said. She started to protest. He looked at her, his eyes expressionless, and she swallowed and fell silent. Yes, Tannis said. Stay with Raceland, lady, please. We'll bring the staff to you. 
Hurry then, she said through white lips. He is very nearly gone. We'll hurry, Tannis said grimly. I have a feeling that once things get started out there, we're going to be moving very fast. He patted her hand. Come on. He stood up and took a deep breath. Riverwind's eyes were still on Gold Moon. He started to speak, then shook his head irritably and turned without a word to stand beside Tannis. Sturm joined them. The three crept up behind the draconian guards. Kerman lifted his sword. It flashed in the firelight. The dragon went into a wild frenzy and all the draconians fell back, braying and beating their swords against their shields. Wind from the dragon's wings blew up ashes and sparks from the fire, setting some nearby bamboo huts on fire. The draconians did not notice, so eager were they for the kill. The dragon shrieked and howled and Karaman felt his mouth go dry and his stomach muscles clench. It was the first time he had ever gone into battle without his brother. The thought made his heart throb painfully. He was about to leap forward and attack when Tannis, Sturm, and Riverwind appeared out of nowhere to stand by his side. We will not let our friend die alone, the half-elf cried defiantly at the dragon. The draconians cheered wildly. Get out of here, Tannis, Caraman scowled, his face flushing and streaked with tears. This is my fight. Shut up and listen, Tannis ordered. Get your sword in mind, Sturm. Riverwind, grab your weapons and the packs and any draconian weapons you can pick up to replace those we lost. Caraman, pick up the two staffs. Caraman stared at him. What? Tasselhoff's the dragon, Tannis said. There isn't time to explain. Just do as I say. Get the staff and take it into the woods. Goldmoon's waiting. He laid his hand on the warrior's shoulder. Tannis shoved him. Go! Raceland's almost finished. You're his only chance. This statement reached Caraman's mind. He ran to the pile of weapons and grabbed the blue crystal staff and Raceland's staff of Magius. While the Draconians yelled, Sturm and Riverwind armed themselves. Sturm bringing Tannis his sword. And now prepare to die, humans, the dragon screamed. Its wings gave a great lurch and suddenly the creature was flying, hovering in midair. The draconians croaked and cried out in alarm, some breaking for the woods, others hurling themselves flat on the ground. Now, yelled Tannis, run, Caraman. The big warrior broke for the woods, running swiftly towards where he could see Goldmoon and Flint waiting for him. A draconian appeared in front of him, but Caraman hurled it out of the way with a thrust of his great arm. He could hear a wild commotion behind him, Sturm chanting a solemnic war cry, draconians yelling. Other draconians leapt at Caraman. He used the blue crystal staff as he had seen Goldmoon use it, swinging it in a wide arc with his huge right hand. It flashed blue flame and the draconians fell back. Caraman reached the woods and found Raceland lying at Goldmoon's feet, barely breathing. Goldmoon grabbed the staff from Caraman and laid it on the mage's inert body. Flint watched, shaking his head. It won't work, muttered the dwarf. It's used up. It has to work, Goldmoon said firmly. Please, she murmured. Whoever is master of this staff, heal this man. Please. Unknowing, she repeated it over and over. Caraman watched for a moment, blinking his eyes. Then the woods around him were lit by a gigantic burst of flame. Name of the abyss, Flint breathed. Look at that! Caraman turned just in time to see the great black wicker dragon crash headlong into the blazing bonfire. Flaming logs flew into the air, showering sparks over the camp. The draconians' bamboo huts, some already ablaze, began burning fiercely. The wicker dragon gave a final horrifying shriek and then it too caught fire. Tasselhoff, Flint swore, that blasted kender, he's inside there. Before Caraman could stop him, the dwarf ran out into the blazing draconian camp. Caraman, Raceland murmured. The big warrior knelt beside his brother. Raceland was still pale, but his eyes were open and clear. He sat up weakly, leaning against his brother and staring out at the raging fire. What's going on? I'm not sure, Caraman said. Tasselhoff turned into a dragon, and after that things got real confused. You just rest. The warrior stared into the smoke, his sword drawn and ready in case any draconians came for them. But the draconians now had little interest in the prisoners. The smaller breed, panic-stricken, were fleeing into the forest as their great dragon god went up in flames. 
A few of the robed draconians, bigger and apparently more intelligent than the other species, were trying desperately to bring order to the fearful chaos raging around them. Sturm fought and slashed his way through the draconians without encountering any organized resistance. He had just reached the edge of the clearing near the bamboo cage when Flint passed him, running back toward the camp. Hey, where? Sturm yelled at the dwarf. Taz, in the dragon! The dwarf didn't stop. Sturm turned and saw the black wicker dragon burning with flames that shot high into the air. Thick smoke boiled up, blanketing the camp. The dank, heavy swamp air prevented it from rising and drifting away. Sparks showered down as part of the blazing dragon exploded into the camp. Sturm ducked and batted out sparks that landed on his cape, then ran after the dwarf, catching up with the short-legged Flint easily. Flint, he panted, grasping the dwarf's on. It's no use. Nothing could live in that furnace. We've got to get back to the others. Let go of me, Flint roared so furiously that Sturm let go in amazement. The dwarf ran for the burning dragon again. Sturm heaved a sigh and ran after him, his eyes beginning to water in the smoke. Tasselov Burfoot, Flint called, you idiotic kender. Where are you? There was no answer. Tasselov! Flint screamed. If you wreck this escape, I'll murder you. So help me. Tears of frustration and grief and anger and smoke coursed down the dwarf's cheeks. The heat was overwhelming. It seared Sturm's lungs, and the knight knew they couldn't breathe much more of this, or they would perish themselves. He took hold of the dwarf firmly, intending to knock him out if necessary, when suddenly he saw movement near the edge of the blaze. He rubbed his eyes and looked closer. The dragon lay on the ground, his head still connected to the blazing body by a long wicker neck. The head had not caught fire yet, but flames were starting to eat into the wicker neck. The head would soon be ablaze too. Sturm saw the movement again. Flint, look! Sturm ran towards the head, the dwarf pounding along behind. Two small legs encased in bright blue pants were sticking out of the dragon's mouth, kicking feebly. Taz! Sturm yelled. Get out! The head's going to burn! I can't! I'm stuck! came a muffled voice. Sturm stared at the head, frantically trying to figure out how to free the kender, while Flint just grabbed hold of Taz's legs and pulled. Ouch, stop, yelled Taz. No good, the dwarf puffed. He stuck fast. The inferno crept up the dragon's neck. Sturm drew his sword. I may cut off his head, he muttered to Flint, but it's his only chance. Estimating the size of the kender, guessing where the head would be, and hoping his hands weren't stretched out over his head, Sturm lifted his sword above the dragon's neck. Flint closed his eyes. The knight took a deep breath and brought the blade crashing down on the dragon, severing the head from the neck. There was a cry from the kender inside, but whether from pain or astonishment, Sturm couldn't tell. Pull, he yelled at the dwarf. Flint grabbed hold of the wicker head and pulled it away from the blazing neck. Suddenly a tall, dark shape loomed out of the smoke. Sturm whipped around, sword ready, then saw it was Riverwind. What are you? The plainsman stared at the dragon's head. Perhaps Flint and Sturm had gone mad. The kender's stuck in there, Sturm yelled. We can't take the head apart out here, surrounded by draconians. We've got to... His words were lost in a roar of flame, but Riverwind finally saw the blue legs sticking out of the dragon's mouth. He grabbed hold of one side of the dragon's head, thrusting his hands in one of the eye sockets. Sturm got hold of the other, and together they lifted the head, kender inside, and began running through the camp. Those few draconians they encountered took one look at the terrifying apparition and fled. Come on, Raced, Caraman said solicitously, his arm around his brother's shoulder. You've got to try and stand. We have to be ready to move out of here. How do you feel? How do I ever feel, whispered Raceland bitterly. Help me up. There, now leave me in peace for a moment. He leaned against a tree, shivering but standing. Sure, Race, Caraman said, hurt, backing off. Goldmoon glanced at Raceland in disgust, remembering Caraman's grief when he thought his brother was dying. She turned away to watch for the others, staring through the gathering smoke. Tennis appeared first, running so fast he crashed into Caraman. The big warrior caught him in his huge arms, breaking the half-elf's forward momentum and keeping him on his feet. Thanks, Tennis gasped. He leaned over, hands on his knees, to catch his breath. 
Where are the others? Weren't they with you? Caraman frowned. We got separated. Tennis drew his hu in huge gulps of air, then coughed as the smoke flew down his lungs. Sutorach interrupted Gold Moon in an odd vo voice. Tennis and Caraman both spun around in alarm, staring into the smoke-filled camp to see a grotesque sight emerging from the swirling smoke. A dragon's head with a forked blue tongue was lunging at them. Tennis blinked in disbelief, then he heard a sound behind him that nearly made him leap into a tree in panic. He whirled around, heart in his throat, sword in his hand. Raceland was laughing. Tennis had never heard the mage laugh before, even when Raceland was a child. And he hoped he would never hear it again. It was weird, shrill, mocking laughter. Caraman stared at his brother in amazement. Gold Moon in horror. Finally, the sound of Raceland's laughter died until the mage was laughing silently, his golden eyes reflecting the glow of the draconian camp going up in flames. Tannis shuddered and turned back around to see that, in fact, the dragon's head was carried by Sturm and Riverwind. Flint raced along in front, a draconian helm in his hand. Tannis ran forward to meet them. What in the name of... The kinder's stuck in here, Sturm said. He and Riverwind dropped the head to the ground, both of them breathing heavily. We've got to get him out. Sturm eyed the laughing Raceland warily. What's the matter with him? Still poison? No, he's better, Tannis said, examining the dragon's head. A pity, Sturm muttered as he knelt beside the half-elf. Taz, are you all right? Tannis called out, lifting the huge mouth to see inside. I think Sturm chopped off my hair, the kender wailed. Lucky it wasn't your head, Flint snorted. What's holding him? Riverwind leaned down to peer inside the dragon's mouth. I'm not sure, Tannis said, swearing softly. I can't see in all this blasted smoke. He stood up, sighing in frustration. And we've got to get out of here. The draconians will get organized soon. Caraman, come here. See if you can rip off the top. The big warrior came over to stand in front of the wicker dragon's head. Bracing himself, he got hold of the two eye sockets, closed his eyes, took a deep breath, then grunted and heaved. For a minute, nothing happened. Tannis watched the muscles bulge on the big man's arms, saw his thigh muscles absorb the strain. Blood rushed to Caraman's face. Then there was the ripping and snapping sound of wood splintering. The top of the dragon's head gave way with a sharp crack. Caraman staggered backwards as the top half of the head suddenly came off in his hands. Tannis reached in, grabbed Taz's hand, and jerked him free. Are you all right? he asked. The kender seemed wobbly on his feet, but his grin was wide as ever. I'm fine, Taz said brightly, just a little singed. Then his face darkened. Tannis, he said, his face crinkling with unusual worry. He felt at his long top knot. My hair? All there, Tannis said, smiling. Taz breathed a sigh of relief, then he began to talk. Tannis, it was the most wonderful thing, flying like that, and the look on Caraman's face. The story we will have to will have to wait, Tannis said firmly. We've got to get out of here. Caraman, can you and your brother make it all right? Yeah, go on, Caraman said. Raceland stumbled forward, accepting the support of his brother's strong arm. The mage glanced behind at the sundered dragon's head and he wheezed, his shoulders shaking in silent, grim amusement.